am um, inviting the first uh, discussant, the discussant of this panel, and that's uh, Paul De Groot of the London School of Economics. Okay, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here and, and to be able to contribute to something that has become quite important for economists, that is to think out of the box and, and out of individual uh, rationality and, and open it up to social interactions. Um, and, and I think the two papers that we have here uh, today are, are very important, um, full of insights about what <coughs> we should do as an economist to better understand economic behavior. But of course, uh, there might also be some overkill, right? Uh, when some of <coughs> the authors argue that we should just dismiss uh, rational choice. So I will say a few things at the end about that, right? I mean, I, I'm not prepared to just throw it away and become a sociologist, if I may say so. Let me um, start with uh, Ekaterina's paper that I found very interesting and, and um, so this idea of fictional forecasting and conviction narratives, I think, is very important. Uh, it's important to understand that <coughs> forecasting has a very heavy sociological uh, component, <coughs> right? That's at the center of Ekaterina's paper. Um, forecasting is based on a narrative and not so much on numbers. And in fact, uh, I, I fully agree with this, and I analyzed this process 20 years ago when I looked at the dollar exchange rate, there was a time I did research on exchange rate economics. And, and uh, let me show you here the, the evolution of <coughs> the dollar DM rate during the 1980s. So this is the decade of the 1980s. Those of you who are old enough will remember, right? The, the, the early part was Reagan and Reagan economics and the wonders of Reagan economics, right? And narratives were created about how powerful this would be, wonderful America. And Europe was Eurosclerosis. Right? And, and this was the narrative that guided people who made forecasts. Right? Um, of course, the, the, the theory was based, the, the economic theory was based on efficient markets. And what does the efficient market tell you? It tells you that only news affects the exchange rate. So if the, the, the dollar went up, it must be that it was positive news. So I looked at that graph and I said, <coughs> during five years, so much positive news about America. Let's try to find this positive news. I couldn't find it. <laughs> I found some positive news, but also negative news. And then I realized, yes, the power of narratives. People were gripped by this economics and, and then created a narrative. And this also then went together with what a psychologist called cognitive dissonance, right? um, which, which means that you would eliminate all the news that is not consistent with your narrative, which was also stressed by <coughs> Katarina, right? That is a very basic phenomenon. And that went on until the crash came. At some point, this thing had to collapse. And then the narrative changed. The narrative became, you may remember this, the, um, the, the what was it called again? The, the Rhineland economic model. You know, Germany, you know, the Rhine River, and the Rhineland model was suddenly supposed to be superior to the American model. And that explained why the dollar went down. And then again, cognitive dissonance did all the tricks to make sure that people would then actually find empirical evidence, quote unquote, that would substantiate this. So I think this, this has been here for a while, and, and, and if I may uh, say to Ekaterina, economists have been analyzing these things. But of course, um, more has to be done. And, and I take your criticism that we have to do much more. The challenge that I think we have here is um, how to explain the switch from one narrative to the other one, right? How does it come about? That is still unclear to me, but maybe we can learn from you um, how to think about these things. OK, yeah. <laughs> Let me say a few things about behavioral macroeconomic model. This is something that I've been doing, and, and I see Carl Holmes is here. We'll certainly talk about that also uh, tomorrow. Um, so, because I, I think, uh, and here I, I, I will criticize slightly the way it was represented in the paper. Um, I think this, this might be a way to come closer to um, say economics, as we, we know it, 
and, and other sciences, right? psychology, sociology, and it's an attempt to integrate this. Let me, sh let me just highlight the, the, the main things, right? The way I have done it, but, and, and, and Kars has been doing similar things, and other people have done it their own way, so I'm not claiming that this is the only way one can do it, but that's one way to do it. So it's a very simple model. I get demand, I get supply, and a tailor rule, which um, is in fact describing how the central bank sets the nominal interest rates. And then the crucial step is to, to say, well, agents have cognitive limitations. They cannot use rational expectations. It's too difficult for them. The world is too complex, right? Um, and then they will use simple heuristics. For example, in, in my model, one heuristic is to use a fundamental rule. Uh, if, if you see a boom, you will think that, well, um, a boom at the end must, must disappear, and, and we go back to some equilibrium, and you have extrapolative rules, people just extrapolate the past. But these people are not monkeys, right? Uh, and here I, I, I deviate a little bit by the presentation that Ekaterina gave to it. The, the key thing here is to recognize that agents are willing to learn from their mistakes. They use simple heuristics, but not the whole, their whole life, right? You will not use the same heuristics your whole life. That would be really stupid. No, you learn and you do some calculation. You calculate how well your rule does relative to other rules and you are willing to switch. And that's the key element that, that drives this kind of models and that creates rationality. In fact, in fact that's a way to, to say, well, that is rational behavior in the sense that since we know so little, let's use simple rules. But let's learn from our mistakes. That's, in fact, how I would define rationality in a world of extreme uncertainty and complexity. And, and that's what we, we try to do. And that leads to some results. Let me show you some things here. Here I show you, on the left-hand side, up, up there, the output gap. So the model creates endogenous movements in the output gap, the business cycle, say. And then the, the lower part here, these are the animal spirits. So this model creates... Um, movements of optimism and pessimism endogenously and in a self-fulfilling way, right? And, and they, they drive the business cycle. So this, when, when this is index is equal to zero, it means that the optimists and the pessimists balance each other. But at some point, it can happen, like here, for example, that for optimism gets correlated. People become optimists for some random reasons, some random shocks that occur there, and, and those who happen to be optimistic seem to be doing better, and that attracts other agents. And as, as a result, this becomes something collective, right? What started as an individual um, choice problem becomes correlated and becomes a collective process where everybody, at a certain point, everybody can become optimistic and driving the business cycle, and you get a boom, and then a bust later, right? And that creates then this kind of, here I represent these movements in the frequency domain, where you can see that these, these dynamics of waves of optimism and pessimism that are generated endogenously create situations where much of the time you have tranquility, but once in a while you have extreme movements, fat tails, right? Um, and you see it, the distribution of the output gap and also a distribution of animal spirits, you get regularly extreme optimism and, and pessimism. So beliefs get correlated, they become collective. What started as an individual calculus becomes something collective, right? And this model creates, in fact, extraordinary complexity, despite the simplicity of the rule, right? I want to show you this. Uh, just in a second. So the, it creates a, the, the kind of thing that has been called radical uncertainty and sensitivity <coughs> to initial conditions. Let me show you this in the following way. I, I simulate this model, say an interest rate shock by the central bank, right? And then I ask, so I in, compute impulse responses. This is the way to trace how an in, initial interest rate shock affects the economy over time. And then I, I look at the effects um, after four periods, so one year, right? And I repeat that uh, a few hundred times right, to check how does the same interest rate shock affect the economy after four periods, right? And the shocks are the same. But what is different is the initial conditions. I do that in situations where the condition, initial conditions are different. And you see a, a great difference in the effects 
depending only on the initial conditions, on the state of the economy, right? Um, and also look at the distribution of, of these effects is not normal, making it extremely difficult to use that information to make um, conditional forecasts, right? You, you would like to make conditional forecasts, what is the effect of an increase in the interest rate by the central bank, uh, but this will not make it easy for you to do that, right? Because it's not normally distributed, and as a result, the mean is not representative of uh, the things that of the effects of, of a, a central bank shock. So this is the thing, what, what we have tried to do, and, and I think we come closer in integrating, say, what <coughs> economists were doing traditionally with notions of collective behavior, right? Because what comes out of here is, is something very collective. I'm going to skip something um, and, and just to, to say a few points also on the paper of, of Webb, which I liked a lot, right? Mm -hmm. But I think went too far in just rejecting rational choice, right? Um, I think it's overdone, right? Um, and and <coughs> it's true, of course, that rational choice theory disregards a lot of interesting social and moral dimensions as, as it is based on individual choice. And as individuals, we are influenced by other individuals. So we are, we are a social animal, right? We have to recognize this. Yet, simplification can sometimes be useful <coughs> when one wants to analyze a particular limited problem. Let me give you the example of demand theory, right? Demand reacts negatively to price increases, ceteris paribus. And this has turned out, turned out to be a very powerful prediction. Right? Of course, you don't explain the whole world, but it's a very simple, well-defined problem that you um, study. And this is so, this, despite the fact that this underlying assumption of agents maximizing individual utility is a restricted one, and disregards <laughs> many other important dimensions of human behavior. Theory is always simplification like the tube map, right? It's precisely because it is simple and abstracts for many issues, for example, the location of Italian restaurants in London, that it is useful. You do not criticize the tube map because it does not give information on the location of restaurants. Right? <laughs> of course, it's also true that sometimes economists have pretended that their tube map is useful to find restaurants in London. And then, of course, economists have gone too far. Thank you for your attention.